Resident Evil Village is the second in a duology of games with the protagonist Ethan Winters. While I have a lot of thoughts on its predecessor, Resident Evil 7, I'd like to contain my thoughts today in particular to a segment of Resident Evil Village that is often touted as its most frightening. First, some backstory. I'm going to assume some passing familiarity with Resident Evil as an IP. After all, as I write this, a Resident Evil series is airing on Netflix, and people are watching it and comparing it to a string of movies bearing the series name from the early 2000s. It is a video game series that has been releasing entries since the mid-90s. That may make it seem like there will be too much to absorb here, but the various bits and bobs of lore are not really what I want to focus on today. Resident Evil Village opens with Ethan Winters with his wife Mia and newborn daughter Rosemary having relocated to a small European village following the events of Resident Evil 7. Ethan seems particularly isolated in this opening. If you carry the baby from room to room, Ethan will make comments that hint at a sense of dissatisfaction in his marriage. More than even that, however, Ethan seems isolated in comparison to Mia who is making a local dish, who has gone to the village and picked up local wine. You get the feeling that Ethan doesn't go out much, and when he does, he hasn't integrated into the community at all. He's a stranger here. He's also remarkably emasculated in comparison to the ending of Resident Evil 7, which sees him armed to the teeth fighting enormous monsters made of slime. Rather than the action hero Seven had him end as, Village opens with Ethan trapped in a domestic prison with Mia as his jailer. It is in fact the extraordinary violence done to Mia, Chris Redfield showing up and shooting her like a hundred times, and the kidnapping of his daughter that will see Ethan undertake the traditional journey once more to empowered video game protagonist. Do you have a gun? What? Please tell me you have a gun. No, why would I? And I think that's really interesting. And I want to talk about a lot of things connected to that. But in particular, I want to talk about Donna's house and how it echoes this opening and how the puzzles the players must interact with in House Beneviento can be read as a metaphor for domestic violence and masculine anxiety. This doesn't mean that Resident Evil Village is narratively about domestic violence, just that it can be looked at this way. I am not telling you that the video game is bad and sexist. Please do not yell at me about video games. I just want to talk to you about this very scary part of the game, and one of the ways I found it so effective and frightening the more I thought about it. You can look at Donna's house through this lens, and read it as a way the game positions Ethan's hegemonic masculinity against its camp carnivalesque antagonists, which I will be doing. But that doesn't mean that I don't like Resident Evil Village. I'd actually argue it means that I like it a lot, because I've been trying to write this since it came out. Donna's house lives rent-free in my head. I don't think that there's any grand reason to consider Resident Evil Village through this kind of lens, either. I just enjoy looking at the game this way. I swear, we're all just having fun here. Don't anybody make it weird. With that said, in Donna's house, Women are objects, and the test for Ethan is his ability to enact violence on these objects without being consumed by the emasculation of domesticity. Ethan arrives at Donna's home, House Beneviento, chasing a hallucination of Mia and Rose, and when he enters, he is immediately disarmed, placed back in the disempowered state he was in at the beginning of the game in his own home. Wait, where's my gun? Within the empty home, he finds what appears to be a morgue, with a life-size wooden mannequin that looks like his wife Mia. Ethan must manipulate and dismember this body in order to solve the puzzles necessary to save Rosemary, cutting away Mia's bandages with a razor, pulling apart wooden legs and arms at the joints, prying answers out of her mouth with gardening tweezers. At the end of this dissection, Ethan arranges strips of film, Photos of emotionally charged objects focused on items of personal meaning to the Winters family, described in impersonal tones. In the introduction to gender and the nuclear family in 21st century horror, Kimberly Jackson notes that the traditional masculine hero distances himself from women and children to better maintain his masculine integrity. Though Ethan's extraordinary 
violent measures are ostensibly in service of reuniting his family, Ethan is also only capable of this violence because of his separation from Mia and Rose. The violence that empowers him as a video game protagonist isn't present in his domestic space, no cachet of Ethan's guns to find in the game's opening. Even to enter Donna's home and face her challenge requires Ethan to distance himself from his family, literally requiring the player to give up Ethan's photo of Mia and Rose along with his weapons. The start of the game sees him trapped, with it together in a community Ethan doesn't belong to, only interrupted by Chris Redfield's violent intervention. Within Donna's home, Ethan is once again trapped in the prison of domesticity and only through a willingness to dismember the object representation of his wife as Chris did at the beginning of the game is he able to proceed. This act of violation leads to Ethan being chased by a monster often described as the most frightening in the game. It appears in the form of an enormous newborn, wet with blood and placenta, dragging its umbilical cord behind it. Digging into the game's concept art notes lets you know that the baby is female. She is a hallucination of Ethan's. Her startlingly realistic gurgles, giggles, shrieks, cries, and screams come from an oversized mouth that seems almost vaginal in design. If she gets too close, she devours Ethan, consuming him whole, and you must start over. It fascinates me that Ethan's baby is named Rosemary which feels like a small nod to Rosemary's baby. Like the Rosemary of the film, Ethan is uncertain as to how human his child is, which is why when he hallucinates the infant, it can be seen as a manifestation of those anxieties. However, that perceived inhumanity in the end is a product of him rather than of Mia. He sees his daughter threatened by a dangerous and corrupting influence, but that corruption is already living inside of him. Ethan already has the capacity for monstrousness. The call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> Past the infant, Ethan is once again confronted with objects. This time, instead of a person being turned into an unflinching object subjected to violence, the object puppets themselves become people, armed threats to Ethan's life. This portion of the house is crowded with puppets, and Ethan must seek a specific one made anonymous by its similarity. As the clock ticks down, the dolls come alive, and assault him before retreating, giggling. Finally, upon completing this game of hide-and-seek, Ethan is attacked by one more doll which he stabs in the eye. His own hallucinations fade, revealing the puppet Angie he stabbed was actually the woman Donna, making the link between the doll and the woman even more explicit. The dismembering of the doll within the dollhouse can be read as a metaphor for domestic violence, even dressed as it is in the clinical setting of an autopsy. Yeah. You do this to Rose, too. Though the setting is a morgue, it's a morgue inside of a house and can be read in that domestic setting as the way clinical and institutional violence interact with domestic violence, often working in conjunction with the abuser to break down and discredit the victim. The autopsy is investigative, but also less action-oriented than other portions of the series, often reminding players of games like Silent Hill 2, another game where the investigation reveals another kind of domestic violence. Critically, parts of House Beneviento's autopsy can be avoided if the player already remembers key details like Ethan and Mia's wedding anniversary date, which you can discover earlier in the game. At the end of his ordeal in Donna's house, Ethan is rewarded with another piece of his daughter, the infant having been turned into a series of MacGuffins for the player to find, another girl reduced to an object. In Donna's house, women are objects. Sometimes you collect them, sometimes they break. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks especially to my spouse, David, who you can find over at Red Conversation on YouTube. He helped me with the editing and he's letting me use his footage from his channel and I just really appreciate all his help. Uh, I want to thank also one of my patrons in particular, Suze, who helped me, I hope it's Suze, if it's not, I'm sorry, but who pointed out the Silent Hill 2 connection that I just totally would have like spaced otherwise and I'm glad thank you 
of course, I must express my deepest gratitude to all my patrons for supporting these weird little projects. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope to do more. You can find my socials and links on where to support my work down in the description. Don't be weird that some of them have my dead name. That's just, it's, that's just a trans thing. Okay, thanks so much. Bye. Ah, what the fuck?